where I think this is the most kind of important uh, piece in my opinion, which is kind of what is Web3? Like what is the, uh, the opportunity here? Yeah, yeah, NFTs are art, like what does it really mean? Like people are paying a lot for them, but like what is the, you know, what we're excited about is the future of where this technology is going, uh, which is really radical. And we think it's, the internet is, is quite literally evolving right now. And that's why it's called Web3, you know, from Web2. Um, you have this kind of Web2 thing that we think sucked. Like it was bad for, or not bad, but it was, you know, it, it, users were being taken advantage of. Um, creators, if you look at creators, like look at Instagram, look at Facebook, all of the amazing work that artists are now being able to monetize off directly, you know, through NFTs, they were literally just posting on Instagram. Um, we had a great quote from uh, an artist, Brandon Bro, at the gallery who said, I was an intern for Instagram for 11 years, you know, like literally, like driving their page views, driving their ad revenue without any type of kind of, you know, other than clout or the dopamine hit of looking at your likes go up. And so um, that's where creators, it's really a new, massive new opportunity for creators and it's something that we focused on trying to spread. Um, for users, a lot of the companies that won in Web2 ended up kind of just mining our data and tracking our location, the apps that have permissions that they should, the websites that are tracking us with JavaScript, the cookies. And so like the idea that, um, you know, users is a lot of it, uh, somebody used a term I like, like surveillance capitalism in a way. It's like mining as much information about us as they can. And this is something that I know really well working in digital advertising for this, like literally buying data from where you guys go so that I can target ads to you and trying to figure out like, how do we track you so that we can optimize like our conversion rates and get you back in through all these different ways. So. Um, for users, we really were taking advantage of, and there could be a new contract, a new internet contract um, that we're really excited about. And publishers, if you look at the publishers of the world, this got crushed. Like the model that you could have a non-revenue based kind of news site, like one of the Mashable type concepts, was just not a reality. There's so many people that sit in the middle of online advertising that take money from the publisher and the between the advertiser and the publisher that makes it unsustainable. And so. You know, Web2 is really hard for users, creators, and publishers. And that's why, you know, we think the blockchain is a real game changer. Uh, it allows you to, um, as far as like digital assets, allows you to issue, authenticate, and buy and sell um, without needing uh, like a centralized marketplace. You don't need somebody that says, hey, I'm creating a, like my own, you know, art store where people can submit their digital art, I can accept it, and you can sell it. Um, it's really became this new authentication kind of system where any asset you can issue something that represents ownership of anything. And so there's just, it's such a- Including, just to cut you off, yeah. just to bridge it to the previous slide, including your data. That's one yeah. of the things that excites me the most and it's a, you know extremely nerdy to be excited about that, but um, kind of tokenizing your information, your data. So I have a single token that represents my social security number, all these different things. and. Let's say that a website wants to access that. Well, now I can choose to say, okay, no, you can, I'll give you my address because God knows why you need it, but if you need it, take it, and all these individual things. And now maybe you get a little bit of money back for that. Whereas right now in this Web2 industry, your data isn't yours. It's the highest bidders. It's, it's your privacy, it's all your information, but that's not your data. It's who's ever gonna pay for it and who, who's ever aggregating it. So a digital asset can be, your data, you tokenize your identity and now all this, if you ask for whatever, yeah, take that little chunk of it. You don't need my social security number. You don't need any of these things. And actually want you to give me five cents for it because you know, my information costs money. Exactly, and that's what's, what's really awesome about Web3 and the opportunity is that because the middleman is being kicked out in this kind of digital advertising market, the user can actually be rewarded for information that they give like beyond just discounts or, or ads that are tailored to your needs, the user can actually be compensated in this because of the new kind of economics. And um, that's a this project, uh, uh, Brave Browser and Basic Attention Token that's exploring that idea. They're exploring it for a while, but um, I think it's the very beginning of this concept of users actually owning their data and their, their, their identity and having privacy for it. Or on the internet, they're doing everything they can to take our information in the blockchain, as this evolves, we're gonna be able to be very selective and actually own our, our information and the value that it, that it has. Um, secondary sales are a thing. This is a really important thing. This is really, you know, it applies to artists um, and also to, to brands or companies that are looking for NFT strategies. Um, what's great about the blockchain and the smart contract is that 
not only you know when the primary sell happens can you split the payment to the artist the company or whoever the split is co-founders on the secondary sales there's standards that are being created where every time it's sold a percentage of that sale can go back to the original creator where in the context of an artist this is a game-changing thing where a lot of artists they don't get recurring revenue from their art selling in the future there's no incentive for them to for, for that to happen or them to facilitate yeah, any of that. Yeah, where now, if you're an artist, every time your work sells, it's great. Like it just means it's it's a it's a thing to celebrate that the artist moved on from one person to another. And on top of it, like the person that purchases the work knows that they're not just paying the person that they have speculated on the art or whatever it is. Part of that's going directly back to the artist. And you mentioned this earlier, like a lot of estates, a lot of people's art, the early work that they do is the most valuable in, in the long run. But they sold it for for pennies compared to what you know they could have you know later on, and so I think secondary sales are a really big thing. And right now there's a, about a ten percent standard for one on one artwork, and recurring revenue for artists is just massive. It's it's a game changer. It, it makes the business of being an artist more sustainable, which has traditionally been impossible, very hard. Like most artists, you know, no matter how well they're doing, they can also be professors. They have other other jobs, and so you know with this new emerging kind of you know, asset class, the idea that you could continue to be compensated. So actually France has something where artists are compensated in secondary sales. There's been legislation that's never passed in the United States to kind of pass it to do that. And so the blockchain kind of accepted this early and said, hey, 10% is gonna be a standard for one one artist and it creates a sustainable ecosystem. Um, one other part about the secondary sales, this is more for companies that are looking to get started with NFTs, is that there's a profitable free distribution NFT model. And this is something that we think people haven't identified and haven't figured out how to take advantage of. Uh, because let's say you're a, you know, you're a sports team and people come to your game. You could give everybody who goes to the game a free NFT. That's an example of digital bobblehead, something like that. And let's say that that game, the pitcher pitches a no-hitter, right? And it's a, it becomes a famous game. Like that collectible, right now they're already giving physical collectibles to people, which costs money. And you, you get know? zero secondary sales. Zero secondary sales, it's just a lost leader you're trying to incentivize people to come early to the stadium. Now with NFTs, you can actually for free, you know, outside of the price of actually creating the NFTs and distributing them, where the distribution again is free, um, you can create a ecosystem of NFTs that you're rewarding your fans with that you ultimately turns into a revenue monster. Because let's say one of these rare games, you know, and, and there's only a certain number of, of the rare ones of that game, every time those sell in the future, that could, you could have, you know, five, six figure NFTs related to these things that continue to be sold, that the sports team or the brand ends up kind of being able to have a really nice secondary revenue stream. And so I think that's a good example of how artists, it really is a game changer for artists, um, but also for companies that are trying to figure out what's my NFT strategy. You don't have to sell the NFTs for a lot of money. You can just distribute them as a fan loyalty play. And it's actually a way that you can, you know, real revenue stream down the line. And so, you know, I really think, especially for creatives, it's a true like paradigm shift. Um, and we've established this global market for digital art and collectibles, where digital art has never had a marketplace like this. And so it's really just game changing. You've had these amazing digital artists, visual artists who've been creating work that was, you know, that were showing off on Instagram um, and, and not being able to truly monetize off of. A lot of these artists, you know, work for agencies and did a lot of work that they didn't have agency over their work. And now it's like a creative outlet where not only can I create cool stuff, I can actually make a career or be able to supplement my career, you know, and be able to start being an artist and, and growing in an area. In a very decentralized way as well. That's one of my personal distinctions between Web 2 and Web 3 is the decentralization of Web 2. Um, and how that, how that ties into digital art and collectibles, um, especially when it comes to artists, you can be your own, you don't need the central body of Facebook or Instagram to keep the servers on. You don't need them to approve your art. You don't need them to approve your bank to put the money in there. It's all decentralized. You can make your own smart contract on a decentralized platform. You can go to your, you can take funds and, and fundraise and direct peer to peer transact with your fan base, with your user base. You can set up your family for the future. Let's say that I wanna put my daughters hypothetical daughter's Ethereum address into signing on the girl. That if I can do that. And now I can sleep better at night knowing that, okay, after I pass, my art snaps. 
Yeah. Now all of a sudden yeah. I have this. So she's not going to have to reach out to this lawyer. She's not going to have to reach out. It's just all decentralized. It's all automated, and you really can start to kind of take some of the power away from these places that have just ever so slight too much power. And then next stage is kind of, you know, getting started with the technology. So this is